so we're here at Brian's house right now. He wants to show us the whole canning process of some tuna. He just caught these not too long ago, and they're fresh. They're not even frozen yet, straight out of the ocean, and here to be canned. <laughs> so he's gonna show us the whole process here. What's up, guys? So we got some bluefin here, a couple different uh, cuts I wanted to show you about them. We've got two pieces here. This is a belly portion um, from the lower part of the fish. This is actually the lining of the stomach, right, or the, the gut cavity. And so this is super fatty, marbly, and then you've got this other portion which is from the loin, which is going to be more of a deep red color and not have nearly as much fat. Both of these are sashimi quality. Uh, we could eat it right here raw. I'm actually going to slice up a little bit and we can try it up. But um, you'll see the difference. The one is a deeper red color um, than the other one. There's definitely a distinct taste difference between the belly meat and the loin meat. The belly meat is significantly fatter, just like on a steak, mm -hmm. um, where this is going to be straight muscle tissue. Um, and we'll give it a shot here and taste it up with a little soy and wasabi. So that's a good sample of that one, and then we'll get into this belly loin over here. So it's almost like a T-bone, how one side of the T-bone is a whole different taste than the other side. Exactly. It's a whole different color and everything. You can see a lot, lot pinker, a lot more fat. This is known as Toro or fatty tuna in the sushi restaurants. Generally, you'll pay uh, between probably nine and twenty-five dollars for two pieces of the fatty tuna there. And then the bluefin, maguro, or this regular over here is going to cost you between 8 and 12 bucks depending on where you're at. That's pricey. <laughs> For two little pieces. Yeah, that's kind of pricey. So this will be the only time you eat it in? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> so we get a little soy sauce. Not the preferred, but it's store-bought wasabi. Usually I get the fresh wasabi, but this will do it. Chop a stick. Chop a stick. Depending on how much heat you like, come over and grab a little bit of wasabi. Smear it onto your meat here, or your sushi. I like a little little spice with mine. Pick it up. A little soy. Down the hatch. Melts in your mouth like butter. So I'll try one of the loin pieces first. So, I'm like him, I like a little bit of spiciness. I'll roll mine like this. This is my first time ever trying anything just straight raw like this, so we'll give it a shot. That was really good. <laughs> Not super good. Did you try the loin or the fatty one? I tried the loin first. Okay, alright. How that so was that hit you. A little kick for just a second though, right? Mm -hmm. Now try the fatty one and see uh, the difference. Up a little. <laughs> yeah, I, I wasn't going to say nothing, but yeah, just a little, a little tiny bit on the wasabi, bro. That's funny. Right it there. Mills burn. Yeah, but a wasabi burn is like a good burn. It's not like yeah. a And it goes last thing. Yeah. Right. Not the best with chopsticks, don't judge. <laughs> Here you go. Like they said, it is a completely different taste. It's a lot more fatty, like they're explaining on the the fatty piece, but super good. It's, it just melts in your mouth and amazing taste right there. So good. Right now we're gonna get to Canon now. Amazing. Thank you for uh, changing my life. Yeah. <laughs> So what we're doing here is we're sterilizing our jars and our lids and our rings. There's three pieces to the canning process and you do that with boiling water. So these are the lids and the rings. You just sterilize them in the boiling water for five minutes. Get them nice and clean and sterile. And then we just take them over and let them dry off, air dry on the paper towels. Same thing with your jars over here. You just want to get them in the boiling water, 
spin them around, get them nice and clean, so that, that way you don't get botulism, which is a disease that you can get, or an illness you can get from poorly cooked or cleaned canned fruits or meats. So we want to make sure we don't get botulism, so we do our due diligence and sterilize these jars for five minutes in the boiling water. All right, so we've got our jars all sterilized here. Next thing is the, the goods here, the tuna meat. Now this is uh, fresh sashimi grade bluefin tuna off fish that weighed from between 100 to 300 pounds. So it's really nice, uh, really nice meat. High quality meat, you can eat that raw just as it is. So you were saying that this is a whole different cut of meat, right? So there's two different cuts of meats mixed in here. We've got a really nice fatty marbly piece, which is belly meat. And then we've got some loin in here, which is the top cut or the quarters of the fish. Now when you're canning, if you're gonna really take your time, you can do a mixture of both. And then that way you kind of get the oiliness of it and just the regular meat as well. All right, so now we're packing the jars full of our meat here. We've got this neat little canning assistant that helps you prevent from touching the lid, the uh, rims of the jars. You set that in your jar. And you can just fill it on up here, pack it in there. You want to leave a half inch to three quarter inch. I prefer a half inch because I want to get as much meat as I can in there of head space for your seasoning and also for it to cook. So you just want to be careful not to get any of the oil around the rim of the jar there. And that's why this little tool is pretty handy because you can just pack it right on in there. It slides in, protects the rim of the jar from the oil of the tuna because you'll have some sealing issues if you get oil around the jar. So you can do this with like any kind of meat and fruit you're saying? Or? I was reading you can do this with deer. Does it have to be like fresh, never frozen? Or? Nope. A lot of the videos, the previous videos that I've watched have shown people that could go to the, like up in Oregon, this is mm -hmm. real popular by canning albacore. And uh, they go and they buy frozen, like 50 pounds of frozen and they thaw it out. I've personally done fish that I've frozen that I didn't eat uh, fresh and pulled it out, defrosted it. I've even done severely freezer burn fish that I would never eat in a million years and uh, I just cut off the freezer burn and did the interior and you couldn't tell the difference between the fresh stuff. And so we still got some of that sheet, maybe give that a try. Uh, I got the deer recipe, so I'm sure it'll go just as well as with the sheep and the cans, and then that way it's preserved, ready to eat whenever you want it. All right, so we've done our packing. All the jars here are nice and full with uh, our tuna mixture. I've done several different ways. You can find several different recipes online, but what I like the best is Montreal steak seasoning. Pretty simple. You just buy it right at the store, and that's really all you need. You can pretty much throw any seasoning or anything you want in there. But what I found for a nice mild even uh, flavor is just a teaspoon, sorry, a tablespoon. So one tablespoon Montreal steak and you just throw it right on top. I've done it with less and uh, it was very plain. So we've got our tuna all packed up here. Every jar nice and packed. We've got Montreal steak seasoning on top. Now even though we were extra careful when we were loading it up not to touch the rims, we still do our due diligence to make sure so we don't have any unsealed jars. So what we use a distilled white vinegar. We just grab a little jar that, or a little bowl for that. And we just get clean paper towel. The way I like to do it is I like to rip these into small little pieces. I go through a lot of them. And then I grab a little piece, dip it in the vinegar, Pick your jar up and then you just give it one run around the rim. Make sure that you get any of that oil, excess oil that might have touched the rim because the oil makes it hard for the seal to actually vacuum down or pressurize down and you'll end up with jars that aren't bad but you just can't keep them for long term so you have to use them right away or within the first few days. All right, so next step is the, the lids. We have a little magnet toy here, right? And so that way you don't have to touch the rim of where you where it seals. So you just take the lid with the magnet, place it on each jar. Next step here, rings. So these are the final final step here before we put them into the cooker. All you do is pick pick up the jar, 
and then you just slightly hand tighten them. You don't want to crank them down, so it's just hand tighten so that they're actually resting there, but you do not want to tighten them all the way down prior to cooking. So it's just a very loose tighten. All right, so now it's time to move on to the pressure cooker. This is a Presto 20 quart um, pressure cooker. Pretty simple deal, it's just a lid and a top, pressure gauge, pressure weight, and there's a safety jobby over here as well. Um, you fill it up with water up to the line, just regular tap water. There's measurements line on the inside here. So it looks like about two inches of water, but there is a line. Just fill it on up to the line. And then we load it up. So when we put these in here, you just set them right into the water, evenly spacing them out. You can do three layers of these half pint jars. So eight on the bottom, eight in the middle, eight on top. When you start your second layer up, you want to alternate the jars so they're not directly on top of each other so that the steam and the pressure can get going all around them. They do sell additional pieces like this. You set in between to make them like so you can go directly on top of each other if you want to, but for this one we don't have that. So once you got your 24 jars in there, you come over to your cooker. There's little lines that line you up on where they go. And then we just close it tight. And we just put it on the heat. Get that pressure building. So you start it off in as high heat as possible because we want to get that pressure, get the boil, the water boiling, get that pressure building. This is a steam release right here that has a weight. It goes on top of it. Manufacturer tells you to leave this off until the steam starts coming out for 30 seconds. So right now we're just in a holding pattern waiting for the pressure to build. Once the pressure starts to build, steam will start whistling out of this just like a teapot. And we set this bad boy and then you'll see the gauge begin to rise. And we're gonna definitely have to try this out with some other things like maybe deer or something. If we ever get a hands on some salmon, that'll work out. I've always wondered how this is done. Get there though. So we got the steam coming out here. You see it whistling out of the little pressure hole. Obviously you wanna be real careful when you put this weight on so you don't burn yourself because that's gonna be super hot. So you get your weight, set it on there. And this gauge will start to start to rise now. Needle's starting to move on our pressure gauge. As soon as we get to the 11 pound mark, we'll put it on to lower heat. Start our timer for an hour and 50 minutes or 110 minutes. It's a pretty cool process. We're gonna have to get one of these pressure cookers too because I just heard that they cook everything amazing. So. Yeah. Do you cook anything else in the pressure cooker? I haven't cooked anything else, but I've heard that uh, everything, you know, beef, pork, rice, and potatoes. I've heard that potatoes, it just cooks like bang. Yeah, I've seen people cook bobcats, mountain lions, anything wild game, anything just turns out really good on one of these. And... So we've hit our magic number, 11 pounds there. We have to take it off this big... Uh, big major heat and move it over to one of the smaller burners. This is very hot, so you want to be real careful. So you just want it to sit at 11? 11, 11 pounds or more. Mm -hmm. We'll come over and set our timer for an hour and 50 minutes. Get that timer started. One hour and 50 minutes for all tuna or fish. So as we're gonna wait for the 150 minutes it takes for the, the tuna to get cooked in the cans, uh, we got some tuna here. Looks amazing. I love the taste. Amazing. <laughs> it's really good. All right, so 110 minutes is still at pressure. I'm gonna go ahead and shut this heat off. I'm gonna remove this one from the heat. We have two canners going now. So we're gonna shut this heat off and we're gonna allow the pressure to uh, go down. And we're gonna wait for that little safety job to let us know that there is no pressure in it. It will fall down flat and then we will be done with batch number one. Should take about 20 minutes. 
So, pressure cooker is very dangerous. Lots of people have burned themselves. Some people have even died. There's lots of pressure under here. And if you are to open this, prior to that safety gauge going completely flat, you run the risk of severe third degree burns. I'm a registered nurse. I've taken care of patients like this where their entire body is covered in burns. You wanna make sure you let this go to zero, let that go down flat. If that's not flat, this little guy right here, you open this up and steam will get you. So make sure you let the pressure safety gauge go flat. Steam burns are worse than water burns too. Steam, uh, steam holds more energy than, than water does. <laughs> Physics class taught me that one. <laughs> good for school. Yeah, it's good to get. We have zero pressure on the gauge and the little safety pressure jobby back here. You can see this one's still going, is up. And you can see this one is down. So we're safe to open. Want to remove your weight so when you do open it, it doesn't do anything. No steam's coming out. We're in good shape. I still keep my head back when I do this. We untwist, open away from us. There's some steam. Shake out any excess water. Got our little handy dandy. You can hear them start to pop. If you hear any little clicks and pops, that's the jars pressurizing and, and taking them down. You just take them out one by one. They continue to pop. Set them over here. You can see there, we zoom in on them, they're boiling up real nice. Still still hot, very hot, so you don't want to touch those suckers. No clicks. So what does no click mean? Uh, no click means it's sealed, but if it's clicking, like that one, it means it's not sealed properly, so you can't use that one. Um, you can't store that one for up to a year. All right? So we're going to have to eat this one today, tomorrow, within the next couple days. We'll just put that one in the refrigerator and uh, we'll just eat it fast. And all the other ones are good for up to a all year? All the other ones are good for up to a year. Some say longer. The manufacturer label says up to a year, so I just go with what the manufacturer label. Plus it's so good you can't keep it around for a year. Yeah. So the cans that just came out are a little bit too hot to experiment with right now, so we've got a can he did in the past, and he's gonna show us what the final product looks like and how it tastes. So I'm gonna get into that right now. The final product is what we would get, right? Always make sure your pressure is still there. Sometimes they'll, they'll fail, but you just check to make sure that that's still there. Unscrew your lid. This doesn't come off very easily. So I use a little can opener here. Just, you can hear the pressure pop, just like a can of Snapple. Inside there, you got a lot of water, some seasoning. I'm gonna drain that out. I usually do it in the sink, but for filming purposes, we'll do it into this bowl. Put it into our Eating dish there, 